was clicking on it too, David. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, one thing I forgot to mention during announcements. Um, last week, we handed out uh, some invite cards for Easter. I'm hoping that some of you are out of these already. So if you, have, if you need more, we have more right here on the front row. Please feel free to come by and grab some. If you weren't here, these are just little quick invite cards, just telling everybody about our service times for Good Friday, as well as our Easter service times. So if you have a problem just inviting people to church, just hand them a card and say, hey, I hope to see you on Easter. Simple. I, mean, I, th- I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's like, it's like 96% of people say if somebody would just invite them to church, they come. It's amazing. Somebody invites you to go do something that you go and do it, right? So I need your help for Easter. We want to fill this place up. I want to take out all those chairs and have, or tables and have chairs back there and have this place just full, okay? So grab some of these invite cards and, and make sure that you, uh, you help get the word out about what's going on for Easter. Deal? Five of you. Got it. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be a long morning. <laughs> Now, well, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at spiritual habits that uh, through God and His Holy Word prompts us to, to do things, to, to get us in habits of, of spending time with Him, being with Him. We've talked about the whys and the hows of, of getting into His Word, reading Scripture. We've talked about the whys and the hows of, of praying, as well as last week, fasting. And all of these are are spiritual habits or or elements that we really should see reflected in the life of anyone who calls Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior. They're vital elements that help us on this journey called life. Amen? Now, this last spiritual habit that we're going to talk about this morning is talking about the community of God. The word community itself is defined as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. I think it's cool that some words have multiple definitions, and and, and community is one of those words. I like this one better. It says, a a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. I really like the first part of that, a feeling of fellowship with others. And I've been told over the years that the word fellowship is kind of like church jargon. People don't understand what, what fellowship really is, what it means. It's, it's a special secret code word. It's really not. Fellowship is defined as a friendly association or gathering, especially with people who share one's interests. It's not a hard word. It's kind of a big word, but it's not a hard word, right? So in, in a community, a community setting, we want to have this sense of feeling of belonging, uh, a sense of camaraderie, a fellowship, of, of oneness. And that in itself is what we are doing right now. You are in a community called the church, right? Right? Okay, right. just making sure you're awake. <clears throat> I've, I've told you guys this before, but I didn't darken the front doors of a church until my senior year in high school. And I was dating some cute redhead. She's still pretty cute, actually. But anyways, <laughs> and, and I have lots of... I'm going to get in trouble for that one later. <laughs> I have lots of really good memories from even that particular day. First and foremost, that I was not struck down by lightning, which was a fear that I had was going to happen. But I remember the feelings that I had that day from the other people there at church. I mean, they, they welcomed me in. The, the love that I felt from them immediately, people that I'd never met before in my life, automatically welcomed me in, and the sense of, of that they loved an outsider. I mean, someone brand new to them. And it was obvious that they had those same feelings of love and care for each other. They were asking each other with, with genuine interest how each other was doing, how things were going, how were they were feeling, how were jobs going, whatever. They wanted to be involved. They wanted to get included into their life and, and be a part of their lives. It really was an extended family. That outside of, of my family, the, that's the only place I could find that was within the body of Christ. And it's a feeling that, that you know, not, is not just isolated to my church in San Angelo. We felt the same feeling in our church in Colorado Springs, and we felt the same exact thing here as well. And I think back to those feelings, and, and really I think that's what kept me coming back. 
in those early days as I started my walk and my journey with Christ, that's kind of what kept me coming back more than anything else, is that community, that, the sense that I felt like I belonged to a body of people that cared about me. A little while ago, we sang a couple songs that fit nicely to what we were talking about today, one of which is called The Family of God. And I love this song. It's an old Gaither song. There's more to it, but I like the chorus. But anyways, these are the words to it. It says, I am so glad I'm a part of the family, the fa- a family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. If you think about the words, I mean, that that song speaks truth for me. For I am so glad that I am a part of the family of God, that I have been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. I am joint heirs or I am beneficiaries of the love that I have received from Jesus Christ, as have many of you. I am on this journey, on this sod or this land as we travel along together making us, just as the title says, a family, a family of God. Amen? Amen. Because we all want to belong. We all want to have others that we can go to and be a part of that that get it, right? They understand us. We don't have to be something different. We can be us. We can be genuine. And we want to be a part of a group that cares and wants to be with us and wants to be there for us. And that's exactly what we can find in the church. It's not just the building, as nice as it is to have a a nice building that we can come into and, and worship. The church is not the building. The church is the men and the women and the children that make up the inhabitants of the building. Amen? And I just absolutely love the fact that I can use Scripture to support things that I say. You know, that's the cool thing about God. So let's look at that. Join me in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25 this morning is where we will be camped out. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of his word. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25 says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that it is alive and active in our lives, that we can still to this day learn from what you have given us so long ago that is applicable to every situation in our lives. I pray, Father, that you just open our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So the actual authorship of the book of Hebrews is kind of still up for debate between theologians and historians who quite honestly have nothing better to do than argue with themselves. (laughs) So, and, And sometimes it's important to know who wrote what we're reading. In this particular case, it's more important today to hear about the what than than the who, right? So we're we're told that God never intended for us to walk this path alone. God, of course, is with us. Whether we want him to be or not, he is with us in everything. He is always around us. But he wants us to be a part of a community, an authentic community with others. Somewhere where we can deeply open up and get to know others and where we are known by others. It is an essential part, a necessary part of a victorious life in him. We're reminded right there in verse 23 to hold unswervingly or without falter to the hope that we profess. The hope that we claim to have and that we have been given by Jesus Christ. Why? Because we know that he's faithful. He's loyal to us. Amen? 
And, and that is, is a reminder that we can do what verse 24 is telling us to consider. That hope that we have, the hope that we're holding on to, that we are professing, we can, so that we can do, we can spur on, spur on. You, you, you think of a cowboy with spurs on his boots. What does he do? It's the side of his horse to motivate him to, to go along. So we can motivate, so we can move others on toward love and good deeds. So that we can encourage one another out of love to continue. Despite our differences, despite the things that sometimes we can fuss and bicker about, to get along, <laughs> but to spur one another on in love and in good deeds. We can inspire others to do good deeds. And how does verse 24 even take place in our lives? How can we spur someone along? Through community. Through being together with one another. By interacting with each other. I know that's a hard thing for some people to do. <laughs> but by interacting with each other. And look at what the first part of verse 25 says. It says, not giving up meeting together. Now just, just let that sink in just for a second. Not giving up on meeting together. Stick your finger right here because we're coming back to this, but this, I'm going to hang here for a minute. Do you hear what it's saying there? That we're not to give up on, on what we're doing right here, right now, this moment in time. Not giving up on coming together and being a part of the community in the church. By not giving up on coming together in a ladies' Bible study. By not giving up and gathering together in a men's Bible study. Is this a shameless plug for the activities of the church? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, because I think it's vital that, that you are a part of the things that we do. We don't just do things to fill up the calendar on the website, I promise. <laughs> we do these things so we can interact with you. So we can help you on this journey. So we can help grow your relationship closer to Christ. It's not just for us. <laughs> and no, it's not a shameless plug for the activities of the church. Because God wrote this, not me. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. Guys, I would be absolutely 1,000% lying to you if I told you I didn't get concerned when I didn't see you here. I'm just being honest. It, it concerns me because I love you guys. I care for you. I care for your, your, your emotional, your physical, your spiritual sense. And I want you here when we do stuff. Because I care for you. It's not just about attendance numbers. It's not just about checks and dollar bills and the offering plate. I know a lot of churches get bad raps for that. Yes, we have to report all that stuff. But that's not why we do what we do. It's because of the outcry of this passage. This passage has the same concern for you that I do. What does it go, go on to say there in verse 25? Go back there. Not giving, up on a habit, not giving up a meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. As some are in the habit of doing, that was a problem even back then, guys. It's in the scripture because it was God's concern also. It broke God's heart when he didn't see his people coming together in a sense of community. It bothered him so much that he included it in his word. It's not just Pastor Brad concerned about this, then you're not here. It's God too, amen? Somehow, many people here and all across the country who call themselves Christians think church is optional. But in all reality, and again, this is not from a Patty Numbers <laughs> point of view, but in all reality, a Christian community is the means of being a part of a church. It's a non-negotiable part of having a, a relationship, a healthy relationship, not just with God, but with other believers and being an effective believer. Amen? Man, sometimes hearing what God has to say to you isn't so much fun, is it? <laughs> sometimes not so much fun saying it either. John Wesley himself said this. It says, Christianity is not a religion for solitude and solitary. The Bible knows nothing 
of solitary religion. And that is precisely what this passage is, is saying and talking to us about. We're, we're, we're not called to do this thing called life by ourselves. There are others who want to come alongside us to hold us up when we're down, to give us a high five when we're up, to, to do life with us. And I've had people tell me, well, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Can you still be a Christian and not go to church? Yes, you can. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Granted, that verse doesn't say your bottom has to be in a pew seat every Sunday. It doesn't say that. All that is required of us is to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. But we're called to do so much more than that. We're called to grow our faith. And we do that through all the things that we've been talking about these last few weeks. This has not just been a challenge on, on me to you to try and get you motivated. It's been a challenge from God to remind us of the things that we have to do on top of that verse we just read in Romans. To get into his word. To get on our knees and, and pray in good times and in bad. And if necessary, fast for that time of focus on God and what he's trying to say to us. And, and, and the cherry on top of the Sunday is being a part of the community of God. Guys, we need each other. We can't do this on our own. One commentary put it this way. It said, regular attendance at church meetings facilitates love for one another because they were, re were receiving reminders and exhortation or urging to persevere. It is only natural for one who has abandoned his or her faith to absent him or himself or herself from the meetings of his or her church. However, it is a, this is the very such thing that a person should not do. We need each other. It, think about a job. You have a job. You have to be there, right? If you're not there, you've abandoned said job, and hence you end up with no job. Am I wrong? <laughs> you don't show up to work. Guess what? You're not going to be employed very long. And it's, it's, it's like a sports team. If you play volleyball, basketball, football, whatever, guess what? You have to be there. <laughs> you have to come to the practices. You have to prepare yourself. You have to show up on game day. Guess what? You don't do that, you don't play. Why is church any different? Why do we throw that in the optional category? <laughs> I'm just asking. You don't have to answer. <laughs> you know, hopefully, <laughs> when you come here, you, you learn something. My prayer is that, that you're challenged by God every time you're here. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job, I guess. Which this isn't the job for me, but whatever. But that, the idea is that you come here and you gain knowledge and you draw closer to him and you can build your relationship. And, and, and you expect to grow. So how can you expect to grow and not be here? <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> like I said, I just got back from Fergus Falls. We had our annual district meetings where I go and renew my license so I can keep doing what I do. And we talked about a various sundry of topics, and church attendance came up. One of the things that was brought to our attention by one of the speakers was empty chairs. Look around. A few empty chairs in here, isn't there? 
One of the things that was said to us as, a, as pastors, we need to have, catch this, a holy discontentment for the empty chairs in our churches. That, that these empty chairs should bother us. That these empty chairs should represent souls. Souls that aren't here hearing what God wants to say to them. Souls that, that need Jesus. Souls that if their hearts aren't right with God, they're going to die and they're going to go to hell and they're going to live in damnation for the rest of eternity. <laughs> Guess what? That holy discontentment shouldn't just be my problem. It should be your problem as well. This should bother you just as much as it does me. And again, it has nothing to do with church attendance numbers or, or, or giving. I don't care about that stuff. I care about the souls who aren't in these chairs. And my hope and my prayer is that you do as well. These chairs could be your neighbor. It could be your best friend at work. It could be your spouse. It could be a family member. You with me? This shouldn't just be my concern, guys. This should be your concern as well. And that was a complete bonus sermon written about 1 o'clock this morning, by the way, so that was free of charge. But at some point, we have to get to where these empty chairs bother us. And we have to do everything that we can to put a butt in that chair. <laughs> Am I wrong? Look back at the last part there of verse 25. It says, But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day is approaching. So I guess, you know, you can give yourself a pep talk every now and then if you want to. I mean, I've done it. <laughs> I sound kind of weird. But I mean, you can do that. But think about how much more effective a pep talk would be if you had somebody patting you on the back, saying, man, that was awesome. I'm so glad that God's moving in your life. That is amazing. Praise the Lord. Or you know what? I'm sorry that you're going through that. Man. That sucks, I'm sorry. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to be here for you. Let me pick you up. Let me be there so you don't have to be there by yourself. We can and we should be encouraging people when they go through stuff. Be there with them when they're down. Be there with them when they're up. <laughs> Because it's nice to have someone there to hold you up and to keep you up. That, there's just something about helping your demeanor, and, and that's why it's called encouragement. And, and we don't have much time to do this encouraging. Time is of the essence. The author here is referencing the second coming of Christ. Guess what, guys? It's not on the calendar. <laughs> it is not on the church page calendar that, oh, by the way, Jesus is coming back on this day. We don't know. We don't know when he's coming back. So we have to do everything that we can in the time that we have to take care of our holy discontentment, to encourage people, to build them up, to support them, to be Christ to them. We have to do what God has called us to do and to go out into all the world. And all the world can start with your workplace your schoolroom, whatever. Amen? So let's take this next level, shall we? If we, the church, are encouraging corporately through things like our worship services or our small groups or, or whatever, guess what that takes? People. It takes people to make this stuff happen. And you're sitting there thinking, great, Pastor, I'm sitting right here. I'm here all the time. 
You're kind of preaching to the choir, right? I'm glad you're here. I love you. I love the fact that you're here. But you have to ask yourself, self, how can I take this one step further? How can I go from here to here? You have to ask God what he can do in your life and and ask you how you can become more involved in this idea of encouraging others and spurring others along. The people who are sitting here right now who need encouraging, who need spurring, and the people we don't even know who's going to walk through those doors yet. They need encouraging. They need spurring on as well. Amen? Amen? Jump over to the Old Testament, Psalm 145. There's like a million psalms. But we're going to look at Psalm 145, 4 through 7. Psalm 145, 4 through 7. It says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. It's not just about passing the word of God on to others. That's important. (laughs) But it's also about passing the torch to keep things going. I I want you to do something for me. Think in your mind right now about someone who taught you something, who taught you what you know, be it what you do for a living, how you farm, who taught you how to preach, whatever. All right? Think about who taught you what you know. Okay? Get those person, persons, whatever in your mind. Okay? Ask yourself this question. Who taught them? And then ask yourself another question. Who taught them? And then ask yourself another question. Who taught them? You get me? In order for us to to gather in the various ways that we do, in in order for us to, as, as our passage this morning says, hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, in order for us to consider how we may spur one another on towards our good deeds, in order for us to continue to encourage one another, The church needs to continue on. And how can we do that? It needs you. This is not a one-man army. Jesus himself couldn't do this by himself. That's why he went out and recruited the disciples. Well, I guess he could have. I guess he is God, but whatever. (laughs) He gives us an example. He got disciples. He had helpers, okay? (laughs) But what did the Lord do with those disciples? He grew their numbers. He added to their numbers. Now, I don't consider anyone to be my disciple because we are all disciples of God. But we're called to add to our numbers to the, of those who believe. Amen? So in order for, for the community of God to grow, we need to go out and do our part and grow the community. Notice I'm saying we. We do that by getting involved in the church. Not just by sitting in a chair and and waiting for somebody else to do that. Because guess what? If you sit around waiting for somebody else to do it, no one's ever going to do it. Maybe it's it's swinging a hammer. Maybe it's teaching the Sunday school class. Maybe it's becoming a member and getting involved in leadership. I don't know. But I pray you're getting what I'm saying here, guys. It's... And am I stepping on toes? Probably. Am I going to apologize for that? No way. (laughs) Get mad at God. (laughs) But before you get mad, think about this. Someone took time to invest in you. Now maybe it's time for you to take time to invest in somebody else. To continue the community on and on and on, thus spurring on a generation, and then another generation, and then another generation. Cruising down I-94 yesterday, I talked to my mentor, Don Ardrey. I've, I've mentioned him many times before, and he's, he's 
still dealing with his, his brain cancer. But he invested time in me. Whether he wanted to or not, I don't know. But, but he took time to invest in me. Obviously, I don't know how God would have worked things out had he not. But because God spoke to him to invest in him, I'm standing here right now, today, in front of you. But somebody had to invest in him. And somebody had to invest in him. See where I'm going with this? We need to continue to spur on for generations and generations. We need each other. Simple. The church needs us too. We need a Christ-centered community to continue on this journey called life. We need people to continue to build up this Christ-centered community so we can continue on. It takes spiritual discipline. It takes spiritual habits, the things that we've been talking about, to keep us plugged in and recharged. You plug in your cell phone every night. Why? Cause, so it can keep working, right? <laughs> Plug in and be a part of the community so you can get recharged, so you can keep doing what God has asked you to do. Amen? Amen. So that lives can be one and, and, and for Christ, so that our holy discontentment and these empty seats can be taken care of, so people stop dying and going to hell and their blood is on our hands because we sat back and didn't do anything. Amen. So that we can continue to be an encouragement to people when they're up and when they're down. Because God never intended for us to do this by ourselves. To be a part of the community which deeply knows us, which loves us. And it's a critical part of our faith walk, guys. We can't miss out on this. To follow God faithfully, we must share our lives with other believers. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to ask that you just take a minute. Let's, let's just bow our heads. Nobody looking around. I'd ask that every eye be closed. And, and I pray that as I've been talking, that, that you're hearing God, not me. <laughs> that he's, he's wanting to get your attention in this moment. And I just want you to take some time and listen to what he's saying. Maybe he's talking to you about the fact that, that maybe you're, you're just not in church as often as you should be. Maybe he's talking to you about the other things that you allow to get in between you and God. That you allow to get in the way your priorities Maybe he misses you and he wants you to come back to him. Or maybe he wants you to come to him for the very first time. Maybe he's, he's talking to you about the fact that, that you know that you have gifts and talents that you can offer the church, but for whatever reason, you haven't committed to that yet. Maybe you haven't allowed him to show you how you can be used to spur others along, to encourage others. Maybe he's challenging you to take the next step. Maybe you've been hurt by the church in the past, and if you have, let me just say I'm sorry. But maybe he's telling you it's, it's time to get past that, that he wants more out of you. I don't know what God's telling you. That's between you and him. I'm just the messenger. But I just want us to take a moment and just, as Joanne plays quietly, just take time for us to be silent and quiet before God. And allow him to talk to each of us so we can hear from him. So clear your thoughts, clear your minds. Don't worry about anything else. Just focus on what God is saying to you right now. Focus on God's voice.
Father, we thank you for we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for encouraging us and spurring us on as you so often do. Father, I just I, I feel that, that you've you've moved in some hearts of some people today. Maybe it's maybe it's putting that holy discontentment in their hearts for these empty chairs that are in this room. Maybe it's for for where they are in their spiritual walk with you. Maybe it's for how they can become a, a, a part of the family of God. Maybe it's how they can go next level with you and, and dig in and get out of the trenches and, and do your work with you. Father, I just pray that, that you have maybe broke down some barriers this morning, that you have um, given us some, some holy uh, gumption to, to get out and to not just invite people to church, but to, to get involved in their lives and, and share with them who you are in theirs. every head bowed and eye closed if, if God's been talking to you this morning can you just slip your hand up just so I can rejoice with you I see those I see those thank you thank you Father I, I thank you for how you're talking to us I pray that you would continue to speak to us even after we leave here today on the work in the lives of your people Show us how you would have us to proceed. Show us opportunities. Give us ways into people's lives. Help the mission of, of your people in this church to continue for generation upon generation upon generation. 60, 70, 100 years from now, I pray the Kinmare Church of the Nazarene is still here reaching the community of Kinmare and the surrounding areas. And the generations who have grown up in this church know that their great-granddad was a part of it, that their great-grandma was a part of it, that they instilled something in them that can never be lost, that it can only be passed down from generation to generation as something that God himself put in their lives at such an early point in their lives. So, Father, I, I, I thank you for this time that we've had together with you. I thank you for how you're speaking to your people. I pray, Father, that you would just be with us as we leave this place today. Watch over us, guide us, protect us, touch us, give us wisdom, and help us to give you the praise and the honor that you are so graciously due. We love you, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I love you guys. Hope your toes aren't too sore, but that's all right. Again, it's also God, not me. Amen? 
I love you guys. I pray for you all the time. I just, I just want what God wants for you. Amen? I love you. Give 27 high fives before you leave. God bless you guys. Have a great day.